my name is Monica Reynolds. I'm a Microsoft Azure specialist in education. And today we're going to cover Azure admin roles as well as activating your Azure services and do a walkthrough of the enterprise portal and getting started in setting up your subscriptions. So when getting started, there are four different admin roles to consider in managing your Azure enrollment that we're going to walk through today. The enterprise admin, the department admin, account owners, and service admins. All of these roles require a valid Microsoft ID, whether that is a personal account, such as a live account, Outlook, Hotmail, or a school and work account. They also must be associated with a monitored mailbox because all of the notifications for your enrollment are going to go to these email addresses. Now, at the highest level, the enterprise admin, which we'll mostly focus on today through our walkthrough, they have essentially the keys to the kingdom. This is gonna be a small group of folks within your enrollment, and they can see everything that's going on across all the different departments and the accounts, uh, such as usage. They can also see all the different billing information that's going on across those groups. So these are the ones that have the full range of capacity to see what's going on across the enrollment. Now, department admins, their job is solely to manage and monitor departments. So you can have multiple departments within your subscription and they can only see what's going on in their own department. They can monitor the usage and the billing of that. You can also assign them soft quotas um, so that they can have that to track against. Now the third level is the account owner and the account owner is the only one that can create a subscription within your enrollment. And a subscription is where your Azure services like your networking, your storage, and your compute would be spun up. So they're the only ones that can do this. Um, so again, small group of folks you'd want here. Uh, they can be assigned to a department themselves or they could be unassigned. Um, and that is since the department can be an overlaying uh, factor that you don't necessarily need. If they want to manage the subscriptions they created, they can just default to being the manager of that subscription. However, if they're just creating subscriptions and they do not want to be the one to actually manage it or spin up the services within that subscription, they can then assign it to another individual. And that brings us to the fourth admin, the service admin. So that service admin then can manage an individual subscription. They can also add additional co-admins to manage that subscription and spin up services with them. So I mentioned that the department can be created but is not required. So as we go through the setup, something to think about for your own environment is how centralized or decentralized you want your enrollment to be. So if you have a centralized approach, you may want to look at just having one subscription or a few subscriptions Typically we see one for production, one for dev test or for labs, and that is where you'd want all of your projects to go. You would then be using role-based access um, and our resource groups and resource tags to actually monitor and do chargebacks. If you have more of a decentralized approach where you have projects that might require or want separate networking, for instance, you can then set up multiple departments. So the three strategies for departments would be the functional kind for education that would be such as IT, marketing, or networking and your dev test teams having their own departments. Um, for business, that could be school, your school of business or your medical school. And for geographic, if you're a larger university that has multiple campuses, you might have a department for each of those campuses. Um, all of these strategies work. It's just up to you how centralized you want to be or decentralized. So the final step before we actually dive into the enterprise portal is actually activating your Azure services. So if you have not done this, if you're not able to log into ea.azure.com, we need to make sure that your services are activated. There, the way this works is you receive an email from waep at microsoft.com in order to activate your services. And this is sent to your enterprise admin or your default enterprise admin. That default enterprise admin is your notices and online administrator for your Microsoft licensing um, under your EES agreement. So if you do not know who that person is, that is absolutely okay. We have a guide here that links to our support team that can help you figure out who that person is. Or if you need to change that person for whatever reason, there are steps in there on how to do so. Now, the last thing to look at before we actually dive into the portal is asking this very important question. Do you have Azure Active Directory set up? 
And what I'm asking here is, have you connected your on-premise AD to Azure AD, either through DirSync or our newer AD Connect option, and allowing your identities to sync up into a cloud identity that is a Microsoft cloud identity? Uh, the reason for that is when you go to activate your services, if you uh, signed up with Azure and that email account that you're trying to use to sign up with Azure is not a Microsoft account, is not either your work account that has been connected to Azure AD or a personal account such as a live account or Outlook account, it will not be able to log in. So I've had this happen multiple times with customers who have an on-premise AD that's not connected to the cloud. Uh, this is also true for non-Microsoft accounts. If your school is a Gmail uh, account, uh, that will not work to sign into Azure. So you need to have a Microsoft account. Uh, so what you can do is we actually have a, a starting uh, express setup that you can do to actually create the AD Connect connection uh, from your on-premise AD into Azure AD. And I, um, that is linked in this blog post. So please uh, use that if you don't you haven't used it before. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but you will want to set that up, especially if you're looking to do role-based access, because for Azure to be able to sync your directory, um, you can do a custom directory if you wanted to and not have that set up. Um, but the easiest way would be to create that connection and then to allow your um, actual users to populate and be able to select role-based access. Now, that does not mean anyone in your AD can log into portal.azure.com and access your services. They may be able to log in there, but at most they would have read access rights. So nobody would be able to see what you've spun up or make changes to it unless you have specifically gone in and selected them and given them access to your resources in Azure. So just want to make that note, but this is important because you will not be able to log into your services unless you've done this. So welcome to the Enterprise Admin Portal. So for you, this would be ea.azure.com. For me, this is a demo site. As you can see, we have an enrollment number here to show to you. You would have your company name, a much more coherent name. And just to show you a little bit, this is the home page for your EA portal. So I notice you have all my enterprise admins here. Again, these are the folks that have the keys to the kingdom. And then I can also add notification contacts. So if I just want somebody to be able to log into the portal and get information, they can do so without actually having full admin rights. I can edit the enterprise admins here, notifications. If I want to give them read-only access, all of that can be done here as well. Now, going through the list here on just some details on my enrollment, you notice it says mixed account. What that means is I have both Microsoft accounts and work in school accounts that are able to log into my portal here. That means both Microsoft personal accounts and my work in school accounts can log in here. If I wanted this just to be my work or school accounts, since this is for a work or school enrollment, I can change that to just work or school only. I can also change it to work or school cross tenant. So if we have an at myschool.edu and an at school.edu, uh, as both emails that we'd be working out of, we could do that and have it as a cross tenant. Um, or if I also do have some personal accounts logging in, I'll keep it as a mixed account. You see the start and end date of our renewal. So that is when our Azure monetary commit would renew. Um, so let's say as a school, I bought $5,000 in Azure commit to use um, until June 30th. What this billing cycle means is after I've used that amount, I would be billed quarterly for my reseller. There's no change to your pricing or anything along those lines. Just once you've used your commit amount, you turn into a sort of a utility bill style um, from Azure where you would receive a bill every three months um, for what you use those previous three months. I also can see my support coverage. And then I see Azure Marketplace. So Azure Marketplace is also where you can go and buy additional services within Azure that would not be covered by your monetary commit. So a great example is a WordPress site. I can go and spin up a WordPress site uh, directly from Azure, and that would be built separately outside of my monetary commit. So just take a note of that. You can disable it, which means no one in your organization can go in and spin up something that would be a marketplace service and build separately. Or I can enable it and allow them to do so. If I wanted to leave it disabled, but down the road I decided I did want an Ubuntu server or WordPress site, I could absolutely enable it, spin up that service, 
allow that service to run, disable the marketplace, and then that service I can continue being charged on and paying for without allowing additional marketplace purchases to be made. So that is an option. You also see down here, once you've done this yourself and created departments and accounts, it'll give you these options to enable DA view charges and AO view charges. This is referring to your department admins and your account owners. So what this is asking is if your department admin or your account owner were to log in to ea.azure.com like we have done, do you want them to be able to do so and then see the billing and usage information related to their departments and accounts? So what that means is if as a department admin, if I were to log into this portal, I would see instead of all four tabs here, I would see just this department tab and all of the usage and billing information related to just my department. As an account owner, I would see just these two tabs. So you can make that enabled or you could also disable it. The choice is yours. So let's walk through this a little bit. Going into departments, you can see my account already has two departments. Um, and what's what you're seeing here is a spending quota assigned to it. So really adding a department comes down to also, do you want to assign a, a soft quota to them? So in adding a department, um, I just need a department name. I can assign a cost center. And then a spending quota is a soft quota. So I could say I want to allow $5,000 towards this department. And it will send that department admin and myself notifications on how closely they're using that spending quota, but it's a soft quota, so it will not shut off their services if they were to go over it. I can then assign an admin for this department. I can also give them read access to rights only. Um, and then I can also set those spending, there's those notification options. It comes at 50%, 75, 90, and 100. So that gives you some ideas uh, of around departments and those quotas. I can also add an admin for this department as well as adding the department itself. The department could exist without an admin. If it didn't have an admin, it would have the enterprise admin as the default. Now, if we go over to accounts, I can see all my accounts listed here. And just a reminder, account owners are the only ones that can create subscriptions. So these are the folks that have the right to create spaces where services can be spun up. Now you notice I have um, quite a few account owners here and some of them are assigned and some of them are not. So that is up to you. If you are doing more of a centralized model, you do not have to assign them to a department. If we were to go in to just look at who this account is, the name that would probably be your own name as an account owner, it could be a group, like you have a networking team and you have a general account owner email, that could be one. And then you have the department here that it could be associated with. You might notice it also has a, a dev test option. So if you have an MSDN subscription associated with this uh, account or this person that would be the account owner, uh, you could enable this account as a dev test account. So all of the subscriptions that are spun up would have the option to be a dev test instead of a production subscription. And then finally, we have our subscriptions. So you can see all the subscriptions related to our group. Um, if we look at all the departments, these are all the subscriptions. Active means that this is an active subscription and it's open. If you created a subscription, but you had not logged in or spun up any services into it, it would say pending um, while it's being created. Um, or if you terminated a subscription or if you terminated a department, uh, it would still show up here as terminated. I have it just set to active, but if I remove that um, and I had any deactivated subscriptions here, let's see if there's any in this account. None in this account. But if I had any that were deactivated, they would still show up here. And that is because we don't want anyone to be able to completely remove all of your services. So if um, for some reason you decided to abandon that project or you know move away from that subscription, all of your historical data will still be here. See some of the options in editing your cost center. You can also see um, who is the account owner of that subscription and different names for that subscription. So these are not the greatest names, but your subscription names might be um, something around production, something around dev test or the projects that you're working on. Now you also notice that I do not have the option here to add a subscription. And that is because even though my account that I'm logged in here is an account owner, 
they are not, or sorry, is an enterprise admin, they are not an account owner. So I would have to add myself here as an account owner to be able to spin up a subscription. So just something to note there. So the last thing to just briefly touch on before uh, we end this quick demo here is some best practices for creating enterprise admins and account owners and so on. Now, again, these don't really uh, speak to who these people are, but you could have your own emails in here. What we also suggest that is that you have a generic email. So maybe azure at myschool.edu or something along those lines, just in case if you had, let's say only one or two folks in here that were your enterprise admins, you know, and the unlikely event, they both leave your school or district, you would be, uh, it would be a little bit harder to get access to your Azure account. So just in order to, to keep from that, you might want to create a generic account that you could then log into and those credentials are, you know, saved somewhere safe. You can also get to support down here. And that is everything related to the enterprise admin. In the next video, we're gonna demo how to actually spin up a subscription. Mm -hmm.